Refua Shalema, Refua Shalema, get well quick, don't be sick, Momo, thinking about you, came down with the sniffles guys, nothing serious, Baruch Hashem, but we'll see you back in the studio with Hashem next week, so I'll be handling, introducing you to this week's guest of the Meaningful People podcast, but first, I want to see something about our friends at Moshe Alpert, <laughs> at Moshe Alpert, you know, financial planning is super important, right? You want to live financially free. You want to be able to go into a grocery and know exactly how much you're supposed to be spending and you don't want to fall into the pitfalls of debt. You ever think of going into that career maybe of being a financial planner? Well, Moshe Alpert is hiring and you can go work for him. All you got to do is email him at alpertmoshe at gmail.com. That's alpertmoshe at gmail.com or call him. I'll give you his number. Why not? 718 644 one five nine four. That's seven one eight six four four one five nine four. You can help people achieve financial success. Besides the fact that you can achieve it yourself for you, but for them as well. So give them a call. Uh, this week's guest is is a is a real real treat. Rabbi Arya Walby, and I love the title that we gave this episode, which is guided by his grandpa's wisdom. His grandfather, the author of the Ali Sher, the famous Musser uh, Safer, Rav Shlomo Walby. Uh, we discuss growing up around Rosh Hashanah Walby and, of course, uh, doing what Rabbi Walby does right now. And if you're from the Houston community, he is a pillar over there, whether it's, you know, ordaining weddings, uh, being a hot salah. He has an organization in Houston, Torch, and they're doing an inc- incredible, incredible job in out- of outreach. So I really hope you will enjoy this episode with Rabbi Walby. He has a bunch of podcasts himself, so search his name. I'm sure you'll find something good. And of course, a big thank you once again to our friend Isaac Newman, who sponsored this episode of Zechar Nishmas, his mother, Ruchama Paral Makalea, Bas Arye Leib, and Neshama Shav and Aliyah. All the people around the world who are touched and inspired by this episode should be for the Aliyah of your mother, Isaac Newman. Really appreciate it and enjoy this episode. You are listening to the Meaningful People Podcast. The podcast featuring our nation's most impactful, influential, and meaningful people. So here we are, um, all the way from Houston, Texas. So this is, I'm sorry about the weather. It's a little bit cold for you. Freezing cold. Freezing Freezing. cold for you. If it's below 60 degrees, it's winter. Yeah, but here's here's the thing, Rabbi Walby. You grew up in Brooklyn, didn't you? I did. So you can't even say that. (laughs) Yeah, but it's been a long long time. You know what they say in Texas? What do they say? Um, So much. (laughs) They say in Texas, uh, bigger, better, something. I got here as fast as I could. I don't get it. I got to Texas as fast as I could. Oh. I grew up in New York, but I got oh. to Texas as fast as I could. So you've been enjoying? Love it. How many Love years have you been it's in now Texas? now 17 full years in Houston. You've been in Houston for 17 years? Yeah. What was the Jewish community like when you originally moved there? It was small. It was very small. Um, I mean, there, were, there was one Mincha of Minyan in my neighborhood that rotated shuls every week. Why? Because rotate. there wasn't enough for each shul to have it. So one week it was in this shul, in the Sephardi shul, and one week it was in the Ashkenaz shul. Have you ever dived in twice in one day? Uh, it just happened a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> Intel. No, I didn't. I, that's good. Yes. That's our theme. Diving twice in one day. It's a title. I've had it numerous times where I dive in early and then someone's like, oh, mincha, mincha, mincha. I'm like, okay, let's go. I <laughs> prematurely offered you my hand just instinctively as you raised yours. Yeah. Were, we, were we high-fiving the two davenings in one day? I was going to smack you in the head. Oh, okay. That's what I was going to do. Um, that, that's really incredible. 17 years in Houston, Texas. And you, you're raising a family there. You have... Baruch Hashem, we came there with two children, and now, can I know her, we have eight. Wow, that's amazing. What's it like raising a family? Uh, before we get to sort of why you're in Houston, which I'm sure is for a real purpose, what's it like raising a family in Houston, Texas? Well, I think the quality of life is exceptional. Yeah. Uh, I think that the the environment is a very warm, friendly, loving, small community feel. Uh, it's really a beautiful city. I mean, not so, I mean, if you're in New York City, it's beautiful. But mm. I, I kind of hear what you're saying. You're saying. You said in New York City, it's beautiful, but it's really not. That's what you're kind of saying. I'm saying relative to New York, correct. <laughs> <laughs> so you- It's uh, not aesthetically as nice, as pretty as San Antonio and Dallas and, and see, Austin. I've never been to any of these places. So I don't you're welcome I, to join us. I, Come anytime. So I, I, yeah, mentioned open before, I mentioned you before I was last time by the Knesset Hashluchim and I heard that exact line a lot. So I'm going to be spending a lot on flights soon because like everyone's like, come join us. I'm like what? Like Massapequa, Wisconsin? Like what am I going to do there? 
Birmingham, Alabama. Now I'm going to Houston. That's right. But I was with a, a Houston, not a native, a new Houston resident, Shlemy Zions, last night. Sure. By the Shlemy's a good friend. He's a new uh, new face down there. That's correct. Getting famous, getting people on the map in Houston. It's exciting. Yeah. Um, so people will click on this episode and they see your name. Either they know you or they for sure know your grandfather. Correct. Of Walby. I want to sort of delve into sort of, uh, you know, the growing up with that influence and what role that played in your life. So I was born in Israel, raised in New York. I lived in Brooklyn till I was eight, uh, 10 years old. And then my parents moved to Muncie. They still live in Muncie. My two older brothers went to yeshiva right after high school. Maybe one went before 12th grade even. And I was very jealous of them. I was in ninth grade in here in Brooklyn. I went to here in Brooklyn. And I was so jealous of my brothers being close to my grandfather, learning in Eretz Yisrael. And I told my father, I, I, want to go to, I want to go to Israel. And he says, fine, get yourself a yeshiva and go. So I called my grandfather. I said, Saba, I, I want to come learn Eretz Yisrael. He says, okay, call me back in a few weeks and I'll try to make some calls. And sure enough, one of his Talmidim had a yeshiva down the block from him in Givat Shaul and Rehov El Kabetz. And uh, I, from the age of 15, I was living a block away from my grandfather. Wow. What, what pushed you, I guess, to make such a change like that? I, I just, I, I felt that, you know, we're not here forever. I, this has been a theme in my life. Like, I feel like we're not here forever and you got to do things and do them now because you're and not no, going to have forever yeah. to do it. And nobody it's got like time a holy for high YOLO. school. Yeah. A holy YOLO. I'm not going to slap you five in that one. Wow. That's a mouthful. That's right. A holy YOLO. That's right. Yeah. YOLO is like you only live once and That's people right. use that as a license Papa Ryan. to, to party. Papa Ryan, make it happen. But like you're saying, there is a Maruba Mida Taiva, Zelo Mazet. There's a YOLO. There's a Heliga YOLO. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully one, we're Mekadish the concept, right? Can you that, turn that into one long acronym? Hey, YOLO? Yeah. HOYOLO? <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> and Mappa K. Uh, yeah, totally. Um, so that's amazing. So you moved down there to... So I'll tell you, my, my grandfather was a very special person. You can learn his farm and you can hear mm -hmm. his schmoozing. But one of the things that really had such an incredible impact... So I was in a Yeshiva Ktana. Yeshiva Ktana is the high school in Eretz Yisrael. Mm. Over here we call them high school. Over there it's Yeshiv right. Tana. You're still for any hit. of our listeners that may, before they hear about your grandfather, for any of our listeners that may not know, your grandfather was a Shloim of Volba who wrote right. the Ali Shar. Right, just, just for those, because there are many people who say like, why are you modernizing the name, making it Wolby? So just for the record, <laughs> my grandfather was from Germany and it was spelled with a W and it was Wolby before it became Volba. Volba. Now it's Israel, you don't have a W in, in, in Hebrew. So it, it became a Volba. No, I think you should get canceled for modernizing. I know that. That. <laughs> you know this. Yeah. I've had so many people like, no, it's still Volba. My name is John Kinunis, and we're here. Yeah, I was going modern with the Volba. <laughs> like this whole interview is a really, you know, camera crew's coming in, you know, set up. Like, why do you change the name? Yeah, exactly. Um, but it's okay. We're Michael. Um, so, so yeah, you're a teenager. A teenager. So I was. It was very difficult for me because I was. I was in an Israeli yeshiva with. Limited Hebrew. We spoke some Hebrew. My father's Israeli. My mother's American. So I spoke, I understood most of the Hebrew, but I didn't really speak it fluently. I spoke like an American at best. And um, my grandfather realized my challenge that I was facing. And one morning I was woke up, woken up in the yeshiva and they're like, your grandfather's here, like for chakras. Mm -hmm. I come in, my grandfather's sitting right next to my seat in the yeshiva. You know, what? like, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It must, have been cool to, it must have been a cool It feeling. was the coolest day of my life. <laughs> that my grandfather came to Davin right next to me. Flex. The ultimate flex. So, and, you know, obviously after Davening, I take my grandfather and I walk him out and everyone's like, oh, Shalom Aleichem. You know, it's like, but to me it was like, he knew that I needed that boost and he was there to give it to me. My parents were living in the United States, you know, still in Muncie. And it was like, it was, it was the most amazing thing. And I, I spent... Many, many, many days with my grandfather, eating breakfast, eating lunch, eating dinner uh, together, sitting right by the little kitchen table about the size of this table, even smaller, and um, just soaking up whatever I can from him. That's awesome. That's fire. What did you soak up the most from your, I guess, the, your time spending at the, at first, the kitchen first table? First, his clarity. He was he was a very simple person. He was he had no chauffeurs, and he didn't have uh, gaboim and and he didn't have any of that. Like, 
he came and opened the door if someone knocked on the door. You know, it was like, you know, yeah. it was like there was no layers of like, uh, you know, you have to have pull to get in. Anybody knocked on the door. And, you know, he would have uh, Bachram come or fathers bring their sons on the day of the bar mitzvah for a bracha. And uh, he'd say, okay, what do you want a bracha for? And like to be a Talmud Chacham. He just to sit and learn. To be a Talmud Chacham. Like, what do you want, what do you want from me? Right. I don't have no magic sauce here. Like, you know, just go sit and learn. And uh, it, was, uh, it was amazing how, you know, he wasn't a vending machine. You put in 50 cents, you get your soda. He was, you know, you'd ask a question and you'd think about it and come back to me in two weeks and I'll give you an answer. It wasn't like, and he would give you a well-baked, beautiful, yeah. perfect, you know, Eitzah. I heard, um, I used to listen to a lot of Shirim from Rabbi Lawrence Kalman. Sure. Um, not that I don't anymore, just I used to. And he, I don't know if he's a Talmud of... of he Rav, never learned in the yeshiva. But he, he never, he's... Do I do I pronounce your your grandfather's name now as Volba or, or Walby? Whatever can, you I feel can go Walby. It doesn't make sense. You know so so he had said I heard once that if Walby once when he was younger was walking in his house and he would see the crack of the door in his parents' room he'd see his mother davening for him like ten times a day that he should grow up to be you know Tam Chacham and he should stay on the path of Torah. Is that something you heard? or um? It's something I never heard before, but I'll tell you something I did hear. My grandfather's parents were not Shomer Shabbos. Right. They weren't, they were, he didn't grow up in a religious home. He grew up in Berlin. Interesting. And uh, something which was, I asked my grandfather, I sat with my brother, my brother Ellie, and uh, we were asking my grandfather, it was like one of those, we had a, a, a Matzah Shabbos where the whole family would get together and we'd sit by my grandfather. And we'd try to get as much as we can out of him. Sometimes he would get annoyed that we're just schmoozing and mm. like wasting our time so you'd leave but uh, <laughs> uh so one time we asked him it was just a few of us and we asked like how did you become you and he said every day when my mother would tie my shoes she would whisper in my ear go learn tire go become a talmud chacham and go to yeshiva those tefillas did it wow and she wasn't showing showers at that point? Or she I don't had, think so. I don't think so. D d were they ever in their I don't lifetime? Think they were. What's that? In their lifetime. I, I, I'm named after her father, who was allegedly, I, I don't know, but I have to do more research on this, but he was a Shasid, you know? Right. So she grew up in a home, but again, it was, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to know what the challenges were in that generation. I mean, we have similar challenges in this generation. We have people who their grandfathers were Shechtim, yeah. The grandfathers were up on him, and they don't know what Shabbos is. I mean, it's it's tragic. It's really incredible that you know you grew up with that influence in your life, and his parents weren't religious. And now, so many years later, you're living in Houston, and you're you've gone there to sort of embark on the path of making people more from. Also, um, you started something called Torch. I didn't start. No, you didn't start Torch. I, I came in seven years in. Oh. Started in 1998. I came okay. in 2005. Who started, who started Torch? It was a group of Baal Batim who, after a seed program by Torah Masora, they sent a few Bachram and they inspired the community and they said, we need to have more Torah here. In Houston. In Houston. So uh, five Baal Batim got together, together with Rabbi Wender, who's the Rav of the Young Israel. Um, and actually they sat at a kitchen table, which today is my house. It's, I'm, that's my house today. But either way, that's where it was founded. And they, they came up with this, look, we have to start a kolal. And that's where Torch came. Torch came as an outreach kolal, so they'd learn half a day and do kiru half a day. And the Baruch Hashem, two years after I came, we started a full-time kolal, which has now become the Lakewood kolal. And Baruch Hashem, it's thriving. It's an amazing, it's an amazing... I would say that any community that wants to grow, bring in a serious cola. You call it the Lakewood cola? Right. In Houston? Mm -hmm. They brought in guys from Lakewood. Oh. <laughs> Took me a while to figure that one out. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about that one, Momo? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that is a model mm -hmm. that, that exists. And I'm going to start a Bernie Brock cola in five <laughs> towns because it just sounds better. <laughs> Los Angeles, is, which is where I grew up, same exact same exact process. You know, I think people see a community as a relevant community when there's a colo. Mm -hmm. When there's a colo, they, they feel like it's it's something that, you know. Well, I've heard really good things about the colo in, I think, Houston, but especially Dallas also. Like, 
that it pays really well. <laughs> is, is that not true? I don't, I don't know. Is I don't that know. one of the things I shouldn't have said? <laughs> well, we just opened up a branch of Torch in Dallas. Okay. It's called well, Torch, we'll Torch Dallas. <laughs> Torch Dallas. That's awesome. Is Torch an acronym? Or? It is an acronym. Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. Love it. But now, and you're I mean, everybody, everybody knows it as Torch now. So we dropped the acronym and now it's Torch Houston, Torch Dallas. Yeah. Hopefully it's soon like it'll be Torch. Halb. Fire. Halb is in Woodmere. Hebrew Academy of Long Beach. It's in Woodmere though. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, you go, you go far enough, people don't really care. So um, from at that time where you're learning with your, your, your Saba and Eric Yisrael having that influence. And um, I guess at some point you went back to New York and. I learned in Lakewood for two and a half years. In, BM- in the actual Lakewood. In BMG, oh, yeah. In the actual Lake, Lakewood, Colo. New Jersey? Okay. <laughs> Lakewood, ha- Lakewood started a Lakewood call because of Lakewood. Very deep. California, yeah. right? Lakewood, is there a Lakewood in California? There's actually a very big church in Houston. It's called Lakewood Church. Maybe it's that one they started it from. Maybe that one. Oh, yeah. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> Surly. Every time I start talking, Surly's like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> He's waiting to cut things out. Um, so you learned in Lakewood for a couple of years, win. right? Thank you. <laughs> it's early. I didn't have my coffee yet. Um, that's fine. I don't. I don't drink coffee. <laughs> uh, Coke. Yeah, I didn't have my Coke. This is a disaster. Take some seltzer. You want to cut that out also? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're in Lakewood for a couple of years. You ever you ever see yourself? Because you're like you did go to Israel, but at heart you're a New Yorker, and you still sound like a New Yorker. I'm just saying. I know. I, my kids laugh how I say coffee, dog. Yeah. And they don't probably. They're they're no. hardcore Houston. Coffee. Does Houston have an accent? Yeah, a very strong accent. Your yeah. daughter said no. You said yeah. No, yeah, there is, there is. But she doesn't sound? even realize. Doesn't like, realize. All y'all. Really? Mm-hmm. I don't say anything with that. You don't even realize. You don't even realize. <laughs> it's not only it's the accent. I think it's like the out of town. Huh. Yeah, there it is. That's so you're an out of town or you're not. That's right. Do you ever you ever picture yourself making such a move? So I'll tell you, growing up. There was nothing in the world that could have convinced me to become a rabbi or to go do outreach or to be involved in anything other than business. Really? Nothing. It was nothing in the world that could convince me. Uh, I thought that it was unfortunate that rabbis weren't, weren't treated properly. I mean, I looked at my rabbis growing up. I went to, I'm not going to name places, but I learned in several yeshivas in Brooklyn, some Hasidic yeshivas, some like, the, the rabbim didn't look happy. They didn't, they looked sad they looked veppy you know they were like and it was it was like why would you want to be a rabbi you know just a, it, it wasn't something that was attractive to me and uh you know i had plans of all the money i was going to make and all that and then i had a, a turning point in my life where i i i learned i listened to a sheer and i heard for the first time tamia mitzvahs who gave the sheer if i can ask I actually think it was Rav Amnon Nitzchak. Wow. And to me, it just lit up a spark. And it was like, if all of Klai Yisrael knew this, no one would run away from a mitzvah. No one would avoid a Shabbos if they knew what Shabbos really was. If they knew what tefillin was. If they knew what tzitzes was. If they knew what taras mishpacha was. There's not a single person. If they understood the beauty of a mitzvah, he's not, I guarantee you there's not a person alive today wouldn't observe Torah mitzvahs if they knew the real reasons. Wow. You, you still, you guarantee me that right now in real time. Hundred percent, a hundred percent. The 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 light of the Torah, the light of the mitzvahs, is so beautiful. It's so like who wouldn't want to be there? I mean, the whole world is running around. I I, I left Passaic this morning at five o'clock, and we we're talking to each other. My daughter and I was like, "Who's up at this hour?" People are running. Where are they running to? They're searching for something. They're searching for the light that the Torah offers. We have it. We have the manual. And to me, that was like a point of, of, I guess, inflection of like, that's it. There's, there's a, a calling here. I remember I calling my father. I said, how come nobody knows this? Nobody <laughs> told me this. And everything I do in, in Torch, I try to teach the things that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Let me share. I, we have a Gemara a, a Talmud podcast, right? We do a yeah. Gemara share. So... All the I don't do a podcast in a studio. I do podcast in front of a class and uh, share it with the world. Why not? Every time I'm reminding them things that I never knew when I learned Gemara, because no one stopped and said, "Come, let, let's let's take a, a you know fifty thousand foot view, 
understand what is Gemara. What is it based on? How do, how do understanding? I never knew that until I had to learn it myself. Right. And all of these things were like, if people just saw the beauty of Torah, they would they would they would run to it. Hmm. They would run to it. It's a guarantee. Smeim lasus ritzayin koinam. That's from Abnach Weinberg, and he I I listened to his. I mean, the truth is, from that point on, it was it was for me it was it was a no brainer that Kirov was where you have to where you have to invest your energy. So you give up all the money you wanted to make. That's right. Hopefully not all of it. Everything. <laughs> Everything. So what is that, Kaddish Baruch Hu? How old are you when you had that? Right, you're only living once, <laughs> right? Let's go. How old are you when you had that like epiphany? I think it was, it was 16 or 17. Wow, it's young. It's like a serious thought. But but okay, now let's let's do let's compound that with my grandfather always talking about the achrayis you have to have for Klal Yisrael. That seeped in. My yeah, it was like that was a home run. It was like both both of those ingredients together, like my personal awakening, and everything that I that I heard from my grandfather for years. My grandfather every year in the mirror, right before Pesach, would give a shmu, you give a shmuz every 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 week, every other week, but right before Pesach he would give a shmuz. He would he would he would yell about what are you guys sitting and doing doing in Kail all day? What are you guys sitting in Kail all day, learning and learning and learning? Go teach, go go share your Torah with Kal I think it's a it's it's an important achrayis. It's a big achrayis. Especially when it comes to teaching our youth. It's a big Christ. Wow. Someone that would study your grandfather's Svarim, the the Musser thread that runs through it, I think is more apparent on the surface than that call to action to spread to spread the Torah. Is that right? So I'll tell you, it's interesting. I, I, I learned Hasidus as well. We have a KMH like shul in mm. Houston called Haimish. Look at this guy. <laughs> Imish. Oh, that's uh Yeah, that's us. Wogi. That's right. Wogi learning. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> Gewalt. Wogi's the man. Yeah. Beautiful. So I learned Rubicha Meyer's farm, Biam Dar Kecho. I learned it with Wogi. And uh it's it's an amazing safer. When I was in Eretz Yisrael visiting my children last last uh, year, so I had the privilege of meeting Rubicha Meyer at Morgenstern. Really? It was three in the morning and in his base medish and it was it was really incredible. So he asked me, he says, So what are you doing out in Houston? I told him I teach Torah. He says, What type of Torah do you teach? I said, What do you mean what type of Torah? Torah Sashem. Mm-hmm. He says, Yeah, but you know, this I said, Look, I said, Do you think that Ali Shur isn't Hasidus? Do you think Biyam Dar Kecho isn't Musa? And I can show you threads where what my grandfather writes in Ali Shur. And what Rabbi Shemai writes in Biyam Dar Kecha are exactly the same. Kvalt. They're coming from a little different angle, but exactly the same thing. And it's the same thing as, as, as what's written in Mesil Sisharm. Torah is one. Ex- yeah. Torah is Hashem. So I said, that's what I teach. I liked it. You gave it a- mm. <laughs> so it's, it, I, I think, it, I think it's, it's having a Christ is part of being a Yid. I mean, every person can do that. I mean, you're doing that here with this podcast. You're reaching Jews all over the place. I can't even tell you how many non from Jews texted me. You know, you got a shout out, meaningful people. <laughs> like, For real? What? That's so funny. No, they listen to it. Wow. But it, it has an impact. It's in a Christ. It's, it's a huge. I really, huge I better start listening to what I have to say then. <laughs> That's good <laughs> advice, period. No, but, but you <laughs> to know myself. What, but, I just give yeah. myself advice, Mama. But, Thank you. But if you're sitting on a train, you're sitting on a bus, you're sitting on a plane, talk to the guy sitting next to you. You know? Not everyone's going to be Jewish, but you'll you'll bump into a few a few Jews. Okay, so connect them with the local sh- the local Chabad Shleach, the local outreach organization. Connect them to a, to a shul. You never know what'll what'll transform a person's life. You have to really put yourself out there. You have to just like be vulnerable and and open to hearing no and being dismissed. And that's a little daunting. So the, sometimes. the rule is that if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So you have a fifty percent chance of getting yes. At least it doesn't hurt. Yeah, you know? the answer to every question you don't ask is no. How are you, Wayne Gretzky? Yeah, it's not his line. Um, that's you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Same, Tara Sashem. Tara one. Yeah. It's one Tara. Um, but like again, like I don't know, you're in. You, <laughs> <laughs> it's got jokes. <laughs> I lost For those listening, Rabbi Wolby made like a cut motion <laughs> to the camera, inviting the editor 
to cut. I think I'm going to grab some of that alcohol over there. <laughs> I don't even know where we were. What are we even talking about right now? We're talking about you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Yeah. So so you wanted to, you say, I'm all in on Kirov. Like, I'm I'm doing this. Um, forget business for a sec. I want to I wanna do this. So um, I was at my friend's house for Shabbos. And somehow it came up that uh, their sister went to Russia on one of those summer programs. So I said, oh, where can I get involved in something like that? So he said, oh, I'll give you the number right after Shabbos. I'll give you the number. And I called. It was Bianchi Bleich, the mm-hmm. chief rabbi of uh, Ukraine. And uh, he told me exactly who to call. And that summer I went to, uh, I went to the Ukraine. And it was remarkable. It was remarkable. I was in 17 years old. Mm. And it was just like a life changer for me. Life changing experience. What were you doing there? I was a counselor in camp. And the Yadi Yisrael. Yadi Yisrael, correct. Nice. Um, that's really interesting. Like you, you seem like, even as from a young age, all about those experiences. You know, like you weren't like, oh, I'm just going to regular summer camp until I'm 20. You are you put, moved yourself to Israel, threw yourself into Ukraine. Yeah. So um, also is that I became that at that same Friday night, um, my friend's father's Rosh Hashiva of Yeshiva for American boys and uh, Ner Jake, Ner Yaakov. Mm-hmm. And he said, why don't you come teach in the Yeshiva? And I said, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, he says, no, we have a special program on... Uh, Thursday nights. Come learn at the Bacham Thursday nights. What time? 12 o'clock. When they're done hanging out in town, the last bus out of town is 11.45. 12 o'clock is when they come back. That's when Seder starts. I said, fine. It was in Katamon. I went there and I got to know Reb Daniel Kalish. And Reb Daniel and I had the two Chaburas going on with the Bacham. And I mean, some of my greatest friends are from, from you know, my Talmudim quote from, from Ner Yaakov. Later on, I became, when I was married, I became a Rebbe in Naryakov as well. Really? But um, yes, I was in Ukraine and going back and forth, you know, every summer, every Sukkot, Pesach, Hanukkah, heading to, to the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. How's your Russian? It was spectacular. It was? It was. How do you forget a language like that? Well, you don't use it. You, you know, use it or lose it. Yeah, I guess. So you just completely forgot it. Well, not completely, but. Uh, Come on, give us something. You spoke. You spoke uh, the language before Pos- you started Pos- going there. Spasibo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can sing with Benny Friedman. <laughs> you know? Although there's a very strong. Hot, you're laughing at me. I'm. I'm re laughing at that. It happened on a previous podcast where I said placebo instead of spasibo. <laughs> Became a fan favorite because of that. <laughs> Otherwise, they would have gotten rid of me a long time ago. That renewed my contract. Um, Kharash, oh. yeah, it, Benny said that like Kharash, it's not he in his song he's singing Kharash show. It's not Kharash show, it's Kharash. Mm-hmm. And he almost got like lynched <laughs> in um, Russia. So, so one of the things that that I noticed when I was there is that these kids were really starving for Yiddishkeit, and we really couldn't help them much. I mean, whatever we wanted to teach them, we were teaching them, but we didn't have actual sederim. They wanted to dominate. They, here, they're counselors. They're American. Like they're an example, hopefully, right. good example. And um, they wanted to learn. They wanted to daven. They want. So when I got back, a couple of friends and, and I, we put together a new siddur, and we published a Russian transliterated siddur. How do you do that? How do you do that? I learned how to write and type Cyrillic, and typed out the entire davening. Wow. You want to zero in on that one? That's incredible. And uh, we uh, published. We, I think we distributed over 12,500 copies. Wow. Well, all the summer camps were using it. That's wild. What's so incredible about that is that you you identified a need, an issue, where there are Russian-speaking Jews that don't have access to davening in the way that so many of us take for granted, and you wanted to help them. And you don't, at the time, you didn't know how to write, in Russian, but that problem was so meaningful to you and solving it was so meaningful to you that you taught yourself how to do something so that you can help them. Well, it's unbelievable. Well, with Hashem's help, I learned a lot of diktok as well <laughs> in the process. Wow. Uh, 
That's a, that's a really amazing. It's like and you were young when you did that, no? Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, it was like, well, I put together an organization. It was called Ani Yehudi. And uh, you guys don't remember that song, but there was an actual song from. Ani Yehudi? Yeah. It's from, not Journeys. What's his name? The Rosh Hashiva of. Uh, He's the Rosh Hashiva of, uh, of uh, Americas. Morty, Morty Rotman. Is that so? Yeah. So he composed Could've a song, he composed a song on a Yehudi. That was, uh, was about a Russian pilot who left Russia and came to Israel. Nice. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. Um, Welcome back. Yeah. So for, I guess fast forward into your life in Houston. I, I heard that you're involved in... Li- Just by the way, yeah. my bencher for my wedding... Was it Russian? Was a Russian Hebrew bencher. And we had a card that was on every table. It says, you have enough benchers. Give this to one of your Russian guests. That's wow. awesome. That they can take, you know. It's true. We have enough benchers. We have enough benchers. Yes, enough. I had all the songs. We we beat NCSY in how many songs we had. Really? Yeah, it was great. Net, 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 No? Yeah. yeah. The, words, the words are like, the crowd goes wild. Um, so, Harasho. Yeah, Harasho. Did I, did I not pronounce it right? <laughs> not, not a no. single word <laughs> that's me um so i i heard from somebody that you are very involved in literally every aspect of the Houston community you you're not solo member there you're involved with Hever Kadisha, and day in and day out you are just you're there for what everyone needs in houston what's what's your day-to-day look like uh it's hard to tell because every day is different you never know when the morning begins you never know when it begins. That's, yeah. that's first, but you also don't know what's going to be that day. Every day there's something going on, and uh, I've had people ask like, uh, "Why are you involved in so many different things?" I'm like, "You know, we daven for this." Yeah. We say, "Ach and I want good things to be around in my life. I want chesed to be involved. You know, my involvement to be chesed, and Baruch Hashem, Hakadosh Baruch Hu fills up my days with good things. Hopefully. Yeah. And if you're not involved with good things, chas v'shalom, you can be involved with uh, not such good things. So I try to get myself involved with every need that is that is uh, demanding my time. And I want to I want to like hone in for a second on I guess the Hatzalah aspect. Um, what's it like being in? I guess in, it's a newish from community. I know you've said it's been around for a little while, five hundred. So from families, five to six hundred families. I don't. Is that big? I don't know. It's about five to it's six hundred families. What's LA like? So it's all relative. What's Los Angeles like? Well, Los Angeles is the second largest yeah. from community in the country. Not fair. Okay, um, bad example. Um, so what's 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 that cell look like in Houston? Are you guys able to transport? Are you only able to be mm, first? Well, we're years? we're one month away from transport. Really? We're, yeah, we're waiting for our last documents inspection. It's really cool. And you can go get your own bus and stuff. We have. You have your own. One is in my driveway. Is it orange? No. It's got to be orange. <laughs> no, like Houston Texas. Astros. What color it's is it? It's gray and red. Oh, it's nice. And blue. Listen, you miss opportunities in life. It's fine. <laughs> it's okay. Can we paint it? Paint it. Do whatever you orange. want. We're going to spray paint this thing orange. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us about the Nanach bus. I heard a story about a Nanach bus. Not my bus. Uh, <laughs> the Nanach guys came through Houston and they left their bus there. <laughs> what? Well, these Nanach guys came to Houston. Yeah. For like they what, stopped some, at Heimish. For like some store or something? No. They just came on one of their uh, Schlichos things. And they left their bus. They left the bus came for a while. Came to Fabreng with Wogi. That's right. They left their bus? Just how they leave? Yeah, it was all the whole spray painted bus and they came. They, they, they flew in a carpet? How'd they get out of there? I don't know how they left. I think they, they <laughs> took a regular car someplace else, but I have an idea. Maybe they're still there. <laughs> right? <laughs> like maybe they shaved their beards and right. they're still there. No, it, was, it was around for a little while and then, then it disappeared. So Oh, it's gone now. Yeah, it's gone now. Okay, I've been really like full circle of that became yeah. the Atzala Yeah, it's like, that's when Houston really made it. It's like when the Nanach guys got there. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. You also want me to talk about them jumping in the pool? Oh my gosh! As the mikvah cut. <laughs> it's really, we're really gonna have to cut that one. I want to pull you back to something that you said a little earlier, where if people would only know the beauty and the light of Yiddishkeit, there's no way that they wouldn't cling to Torah mitzvahs. And I want to invite you to. I think part of our work here is to spread the light, and we do have a number of people that that listen and, and watch these these programs. And we want to give you an opportunity to to share some of that light that you feel 
just needs to resonate. You know, I, I give a class to a group of rabbis in Eretz Yisrael, and one of the things I tell them, if you don't feel passionate about a mitzvah, if you don't feel passionate about Shabbos, don't leave Eretz Yisrael yet. Shabbos needs to be exciting for you. Shabbos needs to be living. It needs to be alive. It needs to be exciting. And that itself has an ashba. That has an impact. I don't, I don't try to make people from. I haven't ever tried. That's not my business. I'm here to try to impart the loving Yiddishkeit that I'm exposed to, to them. That's it. Come join me for Shabbos. And hopefully the energy, the excitement, the fun, the love of a Shabbos table, of the kids being excited and being involved. Not We're not like, oh, guests are here quickly. Say your Dvar Torah quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not, it's, we're here, we're, we're, we're a family and there's love and there's joy. My grandfather, I'm just remembering now, my grandfather would always comment that his neighbor, like the next apartment you can hear across the, uh, right opposite the wall, he would come home Friday night and he would dance with his kids, Shalom Aleichem. My grandfather said, that's a good father. Mm. He's excited about Shabbos and he's, in, in, he's empowering his children with a, a great Shabbos experience. Shabbos is not about usser, 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 usser. Shabbos is about look at the day, look at the opportunity, look at the closeness, look at the relationship. So I think that, that that's like, I, I don't think there's ever a time that my children will ever remember me saying to them, you know, that's usser, you can't do that. That that's not what Shabbos is about. I've heard I've heard a nice framework for the isurim that we have on Shabbos. You know, when you display a diamond, it's always displayed on a black felt surface, and the reason for that is that the diamond is able to pop. It's able to shine when it's on that black dark surface. And the isurim that we have on Shabbos is to sort of eliminate all distractions and to move everything aside like that black felt surface so that the diamond that is Shabbos can shine through. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's about the warm kite or the warm kite, depending. Nice. (laughs) But that's really what it's about. about. That's really what it's about. That's it. Just bring them in. Bring them in. Show them. You know what? And people say, like, I'm not a Kiva rabbi. I'm not a Kiva rabbi. I can't do it. What's if they ask me a question? And what's going to be if you say, I don't know? It's a great question. probably Probably the greatest answer is I don't know, right? That's right. You know, I, I, ha- I used to give out these place cards to my students and they had like the rules of class. And it, it, was a, it was a Musser class and like people share their personal experiences. So I was like, we have the Vegas rule. What happens in the Musser class stays in the Musser class. And, you know, please respect people's privacy. Another thing was like, you're not allowed to ask. You're required to ask questions. It's always people think like, oh, am I allowed to ask a question? Can I ask? Of course you can ask. But also you have to be willing to accept I don't know is an answer. I don't know everything. I'll try to get you get you an answer. And there are many times where I would quote something from a Gemara. I don't remember the source off the top of my head. And someone says, "What's the source for that?" Well, give me your email. I'll let you know. I'll let you know right after class. I don't I, I don't remember where it's from. So I don't think there's a problem. But I guarantee you, if every person it's like a project inspire promo, mm. right? if every person opened their home to one guest in the New York community, every from person shared their Shabbos table with one guest. You changed the world. We'll be right back to the episode of the Meaningful People podcast. But first, we want to tell you a little bit about our friends at ILS, that's Infinity Land Services, because when it's time to get title, when it's time to get serious about buying a home, the one thing you don't want to be busy with, the one thing you don't want to stress about is, wait a minute, is title like not set up? The title cancel last second? Does title not have everything figured out? And as we've spoken about many a time on this program, Infinity Land Services will never drop the ball for you. They're going to be there all the time. When you sleep, when you're awake, when you're eating breakfast. Just kidding. They'll be there exactly when you want to be there, where you want them to be and when you want them to be there. So go ahead, ilstitle.com. And hey, if you have someone else handling your mortgage uh, you know, situation say, Hey, by the way, who are we using for title? And if they say anyone other than ILS say, no, 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 no. I heard from meaningful people that I need to use ILS and that should get the job done. Enjoy the rest of this episode. What does your Shabbos table look like on a given, like any given week? Hopefully like a lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of 
fun. I heard you have a lot of guests, like every week. Um, Mar Hashem, we have this chos of having a lot of Heligan Hashamas in our house. Really special people. Uh, coming from all backgrounds, all stripes, all shapes, all sizes. By the way, Kiruv doesn't only mean with people who grew up not from. Right. Kiruv also means people who grew up from and are disenchanted. Who are me when I was 16 years old. I wasn't disenchanted. I just... You're searching. Uh, yeah, I know. Just to me, I was like a robot. I'm just like, I do this. I put on Tefillin every day. Why? Because because we do. Power of ice. Because, the, because the, tar- the Torah says so. So like, oh, like why? Like, so I, What are you asking? Yeah. Of course. You know, it's like... <laughs> but I had no idea why. I had no 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 reason for, you know... It's so apropos. The name of, of the community, the movement, the organization is Torch. That's really what you're trying to do is just like... Just... Like Make sure people's neshamas are, are are lit. Igniting, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's Halig. So I, I want to tell you who the modern day uh, Godel is. Uh, you did an episode with Rabbi Berkowitz. And Rabbi Berkowitz, my Rebbe, Rabbi oh, Mairi. Wow. And uh, now over over 21 years that I've been learning with him on a regular basis, learning from him. Uh, he's, he's, he's changing the world. One man. I don't know if I've, if I've ever heard of a Rebbe that has created more teachers for Claudia Searle than Rebbe Yitzhak Berkowitz. Yeah, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll tell you something. Before I got married, I was talking to my cousin, ben, Rabbi Benji Jacoby in, in Canada. I was learning in Canada for a little mm-hmm. while. And uh, I told him what my passion was. I said, I, I want to go out and do Kiruv. See, he says to me, listen to me. When you get married, you track down Rabbi Yitzhak Berkowitz. And there was no Jerusalem call then. And he was, he was in Eshet Torah. He says, you track him down and you become his Talmud and you learn by him. Okay. I get married and I start asking around. Anybody heard of Rabbi Yitzhak Berg? It's like, I think he's in Eshet Torah. Like, you know. Mm. So I came to, to Eshet Torah and I said, hey, I'll, I want to learn by Rabbi Berkowitz. And I was interviewed by him and Rabbi Blackman. And uh, I said, okay. They were starting then the Jerusalem. It wasn't Jerusalem Kolo. It wasn't even called Torah Savram, which was before that, but it was like part of an Aish like Smicha program. And a few months later, it, it departed from Aish and became to- Kol Torah Savram, which later became the Jerusalem Kolo. No. <laughs> I have to do that a lot with my... <laughs> <laughs> Your kids are like probably sitting around like, you just start middle of a sentence like, which later became like, what? <laughs> what just happened? For the confused listeners, one of the cameras in the studio went dead. And it Rabbi really, Wolby it, it passed, picked up. It passed. We don't like to say the D word here. Oh, it passed. It passed. Very yeah. well said. Uh, <laughs> picked up from the exact word that he left off on. Either way, um, Rabbi Berkowitz was a, is a, was a game changer for me. I had the passion, but he gave me the tools to hopefully succeed. I don't know that I'm successful, but if I am successful, it's because of the tools that he gave us and gives us Talmidim. Um, not only Yediyah Satera, but a, a, a hashkafa, of course, of a chryas to Klai Yisrael, but to know how to convey information and how to teach Torah and how to take, you know, how to love Klai Yisrael. That's really special. And it seems like Ray Berkowitz has that effect on so many. He's, he's an incredible person. Uh, he's, he's my, my children, I brought them in to see Rebbe. And uh, my, my, my sons, when we walked out, I said, Nusa, what do you think? And they've been hearing everything's about Rebbe. I talk, you know, there's not a Shaila that I don't ask him on all, on all matters. And, uh, you know, they hear that question all the time. There are times that I've had conversations or discussions with my kids. And like we have different opinions. And my kids would say, you know, whatever Rebbe says goes. Wow. I've heard from multiple Talmidim of Rav Yitzhak Berkowitz that in the admissions process to the Koyal, there's this like unspoken question about whether you're seeking or even willing to go out and, you know, quote unquote, do Kirov, right, to be involved in Kirov. And like the Eitza to the guys that are trying to get in is just say, say you're willing to, you know, even if it's not your Indian right now, just like go with it. Right, because otherwise you don't stand a chance. And I, I, every time I hear this story, it's from someone who is fully, fully all in, involved on a full time basis on spreading 
the Abishur's Torah. Right. So, and I don't think that it's necessarily going out to do Kiruv. You can be in Brooklyn, you can be in Muncie, like Shmuley Kaufman, right? And do amazing things, mm-hmm. right? So, yes, yeah, he's not out in, in Acapulco, wherever he is. You know what? He's wherever you are. Take a Christ. Take a Christ for Klai Yisrael. And the, again, it, you could be in Lakewood, and and accomplish amazing things. It, it used to bother me a little bit when when people would say that the Eitzah is to just say that you're willing to, right? Even if you're not. Um, but I heard actually from a Talmud of Rabbi Yitzchak Berkowitz, Rabbi Yossi Schwartz, that there's MS and there's MS La Mitay. MS La Mitay is like when Aaron Akayin, who was Ayiv Shalom Veroidiv Shalom, he would say. You know, he would famously bring couples together and he would say to one, oh, uh, you know, uh, your wife wants to get back together with you. And and then he would say to the to the wife, you know, your husband wants to come back together with you. And then they would get back together and it would be, it would be Shalom. And the question is, if it never happened, so like, what, that did that come up? Like between the couple? Like, oh, you went to Aaron Hakoyan and said this. And, and the answer is that deep down, they really did want to get back together. That's MS La Mitai. And Aaron Akain was just revealing their inner truth that they maybe at the time weren't aware of. So I, I thought it applies very much to, to the Talmudim of Yitzhak Berkowitz also. At the time in the admissions process, they didn't know yet. It's a nevua. Correct. <laughs> and Yitzhak Berkowitz reveals within them their their desire Very to deep. do that. Very nice. Very nice. It's almost like uh, like Nachi. He said, he said two weeks ago that I should come sit down, right? I did, right. right. Well, like so this. there you go. That's right. So there, think we there could you like, go. Boom. Evolved. You think Strilly could be like, oh, well, we come here and then like, <laughs> work on that, Strilly. Um, <laughs> Sound effect. I want to ask you a question. If you if you can sit down with your grandfather one more time for an hour and just speak to him, what would you talk to him about? Uh, I would talk to him about what's going on in our life and, you know, the day to day. We have some some days are like, just like, how did that day just happen? And like the most remarkable things. I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, Sunday Sunday afternoon, I get a phone call from a student of ours. She's been dealing with a lot of medical issues, other issues, and she decided she wants to have a from wedding. And I don't want to get too much into the details, but she needed the day, she needed the wedding to happen before her baby was going to be born. It was mm-hmm. a surrogate uh, carrying it, and it was... A whole issue. So I said, fine, but you're going to have to, you know, abide by the laws of Tarsa Mishpacha and you're going to have to go to the mikvah and then I can do the wedding. So she said, fine. I said, here are the, all the Rebbitsons. You can go to this Rebbits and that Rebbits and whoever you want, as long as they give approval and they take you to the mikvah, I'm good to do the wedding. Tell me 10 minutes later, we do the wedding. Sure enough, at five o'clock on Sunday, she calls and says, I'm ready to get married. I'm going to the mikvah at 6.30. Mm. So at eight o'clock, we had a wedding in our house. In your house? In my house. And it's not me. It's my wife that's the most remarkable person on earth. I mean, she's like, the things that she has to put up with, all the crazy, <laughs> the craziness <laughs> that comes up. Like, there's always <laughs> someone. You say yes, she has to deal with. <laughs> exactly. It's like, I'm, I'm easy to say yes. Of course, sure, no problem. You want to come over at 11 o'clock, talk? No problem. Like, it's like, and she's like, always entertaining it's got people. insurance plan. Yeah, it's like, it's really amazing. My wife is an amazing woman and she, she puts up with, with everything. It's like it's amazing, by the way. Yeah, like some people like they. <laughs> yeah, come over for dinner. We're gonna have a, we're gonna have dinner tonight. We're gonna have a wedding tonight. It's like, mommy, could could you all come over after school? Fine, so, but tell me I sleep by seven. <laughs> mommy, can we have a wedding in the living room? So I'll tell you. So it was funny because it was. So I said, okay, let's do it at eight o'clock. Now it's about six forty-five. I get a hot solo call. Oh my So goodness. and it was it was an urgent call. There were another no other units. I get on the call. And then my wife calls me in middle of the call and she says, on your way back home, can you just pick up some cakes so that after the chuppah <laughs> For the wedding that we're hosting? <laughs> but that's like so cool. It's like a different life. It's like for your kids, for your yeah. kids. It's like, it's like my it's daughter, like, my daughter got dressed up in her pajamas. She put on her princess dress and her princess heels. And I mean, she's a little old for that. She's four but. years old. <laughs> She's four but years old, but judge. She, she, and she put on her sunglasses, you know, she's like, she has to dress fancy for a wedding. Right. Right. That's incredible. That's like living, like for a chinuch opportunity. It's just amazing. You know, you see that? It's like I, opportunities I do, I that do. many don't have. You know, it's, it's, I'll tell you like this. I, I don't do cure of an island. I do cure of with my family, with my children. 
So what what I do with my students, you know, my children were the, were the ones during COVID that were complaining to me, we're not having guests. This is crazy. It's so boring. We mm. want to have people. Like, you know, it, it's become their passion. It's become their love. And it makes me very proud. I want my children yeah. to, you know, it's like my son tells me, you know, I'm thinking coming back from Eretz Yisrael, Pesach time, maybe start Shaduchim. I said, so what's your plan? Like, what do you want to do with your life? You know, he says, I want to go back to Kohl and then I want to go to Ritzel Berkowitz. Oh, wow. And uh, I said, and then what? And it, yeah, I assume if he wants to go to Ritzel Berkowitz, he probably wants to end up, uh, you know, up in Dallas. Tor- or up torch is another. Yeah, <laughs> Torch Dallas. That's right. So where can people send resumes? <laughs> oh, didn't think about that yet. <laughs> well, On second you're... thought, email is. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's really cool. Like, that's it's such an opportunity to, like, it goes back to the out of town, in town discussion. Did you grow up out of town? Is LA out of town? I think LA is very in town, out of town. I think LA does a very good job of maintaining an out of town feel, even though it's so large, at least when I grew up there. Yeah, but they say that about Passaic also. Yeah, my wife was always worried. She says, you know, you know what's going to happen? One of our kids are going to be in our Yisrael and the she was going to say, no, sing a, sing a nigga. Mm-hmm. They're going to be like, oh, who said shalom? <laughs> like, my wife was always terrified that this was going to be the, you know. Where's your wife so, from? For sake. Her, her oh. parents are, my, my father-in-law, Rabbi Eli Gortz, and my oh. mother-in-law, Hani Gortz, um, they, are, he, they are partners in Torah. Wow. Uh, so the partners in Torah. So my wife grew up in a cure of home and she grew up with a, with a, also with a, they had weddings in their house as well. So it wasn't like, crazy but still when you have your own children and you have your life it's like like my, my wife's life is dedicated to our mission together as a unit of you know bringing Jews closer and not more recently but you you relatively recently got involved in, in podcasting and spreading to her online what's that journey been like for you so um our objective at torch uh like most other outreach organizations is to teach Torah. We want to teach Torah so that people are armed with wisdom, with knowledge, and people can make informed decisions about their Yiddishkeit. Uh, so every avenue that has been available, we've tried to, to maximize. Back in MySpace days, I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah, but I do. <laughs> okay, so back in the MySpace days, we had a MySpace page, you know, trying to engage with the young community young adult community to get them to, to our programs. And then it was Facebook. Never and heard then, someone who used it, but I know what it was. Wow. Yeah, we tried. <laughs> and then it, we probably had to get like torch five, six, eight, you yeah. know, it's so like to get one of those three numbers. Torch rocks at <laughs> Gmail. Then. Exactly. So, so, uh, we, uh, we got involved with Facebook and YouTube and, and Twitter and all of that. And, uh, the truth is, is like, you know, like you said once, uh, like you, you were on Instagram live and you had seven viewers. Like to us, we had that same shock. He's quoting, like, he's quoting me. That's right. He just quoted me. So, so, uh, the, the experience of yeah. giving a class on Facebook live for the first time. And like, when I'm done, I'm like, okay, how many views? Yeah. It was like 180 views. I was like, that's impossible. 180. And you know what? It could be they're just watching for two seconds. But two seconds of terror also counts. Yeah, and the way I measure, I, I I don't I measure it by, you know, it's like people say like, okay, so they're learning terror now. What? Why is that any different than a guy sitting in Lakewood and learning in Kyle? Why is that any different? So he's learning and what? Terror is Hashem. Terror is Hashem. It doesn't make a difference who it is. Terror doesn't belong to the yeshiva guy in Lakewood. Terror terror belongs to Klal Yisrael. May Rosh Hakilas Yaakov. So it makes a difference if he's a Lakewood guy or if he's Joe Schmo, who's a, a CEO in North Carolina. Does this make a difference? Right? It's Tyra. It's Klai Yisrael. It's Klai Yisrael connecting with HaKadosh Baruch Hu through Tyra. So to me, when we have now, we're, we're over 2 million downloads of our podcasts. All, we have 14 different podcasts. My brother is the big hero in podcasts. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Yaakov Volby. Go subscribe to his podcast. <laughs> right. What's the name of his podcast? Oh, which one? He has, he has six of them. So he has oh the gosh. Parsha podcast, the he has Jewish History podcast, he has the Ethics podcast, the Toro 101, uh, This Jewish Life. I'm missing one. He's going to be upset if I forget it. Uh, what's the last one? Go check Vahula, it out. Vahula. Vahula, Vahula. Right. Here, here's the problem. All these podcasts are about to jump in the rankings like to the top. <laughs> We're going to be pushed down, but it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Who cares? It's Tyra. It's Tyra. Tyra. Yeah. It's when, really the mission, when the mission is spreading the light, Nachi, there's no, there's there's no. no competition. 
That that I'll high yeah, five. Yeah, that's a high yeah. five. Yeah, that, that I'll high can five. Can I join in on that? Yeah, dude. There we go. There we go. go. There we go. That's really incredible. So, so the truth is that when when the video thing started, yeah. Um, so I bought everyone a camera. It was the uh, the little flip cameras. You remember those flip oh my cameras? Gosh. And we got we got three of them, and everyone had a little stand on the table. And it's like, why not just put it out there? And we put them out on YouTube, and it's like today probably has three hundred views. That's three hundred people who listen to your yeah. terrorist year. People get lost in like numbers and say, well, it's 300 views. Some people have millions. Yeah, fill up a like, room with 300 people. Exactly. Imagine there's 300 people in a room like this. Yeah. You'd be like, oh my gosh. Imagine you're 300 people in a shul. That's right. It's like it's way too much. It's incredible. There's this, there's so much we can do. And I, I, we don't know what the next technology is going to be, but we have to, HaKadosh Baruch was creating it for us to use it. Metaverse. Yeah, whatever it is. Virtual the, reality. If you can Scary. get Jews involved, then go do it. Get them involved. We're, di- we're, we're dying as a people. Are we? Well, you, in, in this little incubator here called uh, Cedarhurst, <laughs> you, know, you don't feel it as much. But you go out in the, in the world out there. We're losing people? We're losing people at a rapid, sadly. I mean, I don't want to be my Laz on Claudius Israel, but it's, it's, it's frightening. To like it really is frightening. In, intermarrying and stuff? Yeah, I, had, I have a, a florist in Houston so I told him, we were talking once about intermarriage. So I said, it was like 50, 60. He says, Rabbi, you don't even know. He says, I do, I do flowers for weddings. He says, nine out of 10 weddings are intermarriages. Wow. Mm. Out there in the world, out there. I'm talking about, <clears throat> you know, people who don't even know that they're Jewish or people who don't know what it means to be Jewish. I have, I have had someone, he lives in the community today, but I invited him for Shabbos. He says, who's that? Like, no idea. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. <laughs> wow. I listened to a podcast with happens to be the host is is Jewish and he married a Catholic girl and he's Jewish in a sense like he had a bar mitzvah and he leaned and all that stuff. And to him, it's just like, it's almost like a joke. Well, now my son is Catholic. He's Irish Catholic. It's like, you're a kid. You don't realize that you don't realize what you just did to your kid. You just stole from him the greatest thing in the world that you had. That's right. It's tragic. What could what, and it's yeah. get, it's getting worse because the the Mike Friedmans have a non Jewish mother, and the Rodriguez has a Jewish mother. So when you're on college campus and you meet these students, they're like, "Oh, Friedman's got to be Jewish. Rodriguez, mm-hmm. no way." And it's just the opposite. Wow. So it, it's it's really it's very challenging. Rabbis are having a much more difficult. I'm having a much more difficult time with with uh, officiating weddings, doing research. Really? How do you know if anyone's Jewish? I follow the florist source. It's a great data <laughs> it's source. A good data, yeah. Yeah. He's Solid. Good and scientific. We actually called him for this episode. <laughs> um, I'm curious what you think that the average person in Claudia can do to stop this trend of, of intermarriage. Like what could we do? Because it's like scary. We need to we need to take care of our people. Other than marrying Jewish people. The, the you don't marry one, Momo. I, I don't know what kind of thoughts you have, but one wife. The, 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 it's, it's a, it's a question that Halavai, I knew the answer, but you see people doing some great things. I mean, you see like Lori Palatnik put together the JWRP momentum trips to Israel. That's a game changer. You have Rabbi uh, Goldstein in South Africa put together the Shabbos project. And these are Yechidim who made a huge impact on the world. And uh, some guy, Nachi Gordon, put together this meaningful people podcast that's reaching Hundreds of thousands of people. I and mean, that redhead? Yeah. Sick. Right, but it's one guy. It's a yachid. I hear and you. My grandfather would say, Ha'olam mechake le yachid. Or yachid. Right? What, we're looking for a yachid. Everybody's that yachid that can make something happen. Make something happen. I'm actually here on a, on a, for a visit to, to meet with someone to try to like brainstorm what's the next big thing. What's the next big thing? I. But we got to do something in terms of like the world technology, getting Jews involved. We have to do something. Like if you think here's an, here's a, this is my argument always to why we need to go digital and why we need to get online and get, you know, get with the program. How many people are going to shul in the non firm community? Okay. So I, I interviewed the CEO of the Federation twice or three times at one, at our events and I asked him what's, What's it like? The, what do you think about the future of the Jewish people? Because head of the Federation. 
So he said to me, you know, it's very concerning because I go to shul with my wife, he said. He's at the time 70 years old. And we're the youngest people there, he said. Wow. We're, where is everyone? We're all the young people, yeah. A hundred percent of them are online. Mm. Not 98%. A hundred percent of them are online. So how are we getting them involved in something Jewish? It's very compelling. So that's what you're here to figure out. That's right. You're going to give us the answer? I don't, I don't have the answer. If I had the answer, I wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> Where would you be sitting? I'd be, I'd be working it. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, you know what? You know, it really takes, it takes a, a community of, of different resources. You know, the Thank You Hashem guys just started doing that man on the street interview. Yeah. That has an impact too, by the way. And everyone has a little impact. It does something. And we, you know, yeah, everyone wants to own everything, but it's not. Yiddish guy doesn't belong to us. Yeah. And collectively, I think we can we can do amazing things. We're working towards one goal. That's, that's right. Well, we wish you all Hatzlacha in this mission, and we're with you on it. You know, we're all right. we're all in this together. We're all working in the same industry. It's a great industry. So uh, thank you. It's for Hashem's th- industry. Yeah. yeah, it pays well also. Uh, that I don't know. No, <laughs> I mean like up there. <laughs> oh, Eternal <laughs> dividends. Everyone's talking. About, why does all Jews got to think about dollars? Come on. Um, but we really appreciate you coming in this morning and wish you best of luck trying to figure out what the next best thing is. I'm, I'm assuming your next meeting is going to be a lot more intense than this one. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Of course, make sure to share it with your friends. You know, that's how more people will enjoy and hear the thing that you love so much. And if you may, if you can leave us five stars on Apple, maybe even leave a review goes a long way towards us being able to, you know, spread our content even further and and have more people enjoy this podcast. If you're a fan of what we're doing here at Meaningful People, maybe check out the other podcast that Meaningful Minute has been producing. The newest one is Pause, one that's focused on mental health, mindfulness, breathing techniques. That's, That's with Dr. Benji Epstein. So go ahead and search Pause, maybe Pause by Meaningful Minute on the Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcast. And one thing that is dropping tonight, that is available tonight, the Tehillim Project. You know, you're driving in your car, you, you want to dive in for somebody, you want to say Tehillim, or maybe you're even just sitting at your kitchen table, but like you're not great at reading Kriya or what, whatever it may be. Put on our Tehillim podcast. Go ahead on Apple or Spotify, write in Tehillim by Meaningful Men or Tehillim. It'll show up at beautiful album art, and you'll be able to repeat after the words being said by our orator on that recording. It's all 150 chapters. Um, so go check it out. Type it in on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. To Hill and by Meaningful Minute. Pause. Check out those podcasts. And of course, we'll be back at you next week with another episode of the Meaningful People podcast. Have a great week. Hope you enjoyed this video from Meaningful Minute. We have so much more content for you. You may like this. You may like this. Take your pick. Let us know what you think.